Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming tonight. And I really want to start off by thanking the Annenberg Space for Photography for making Generation Wealth possible. It was a gargantuan project, and I couldn't have asked for a better or braver partner than Wallace Annenberg. And um, I'm so grateful to be able to have this space be the inaugural venue and have this solo show in my hometown. Over the last four years, I've been engaged not only in the process of making new work in photographs and in video for this project, but most importantly, in a process of analyzing and investigating my own work, thinking about what I've been witness to over the last 25 years. But this project is not about actual wealth. Um, to clarify, it's really about the influence of affluence. It's about our aspiration to wealth, its connection to our identity and that of the American dream, and the way we emulate it and package it and export our notions of it, and the contagious virus that is the addictive culture of consumerism. My work considers wealth very broadly defined. So I'm including the currency of fame, the currency of branding, the currency of the body, the currency of youth. Of course, I'm also talking about the currency of having money and what that brings, but just as importantly, the value of looking like you do, the concept of fake it till you make it, as Future the Rapper and many other subjects told me on this journey. I realized that this wasn't just the time that I worked and the themes that I followed, but that actually there was this kind of seismic shift in both our values and our culture, and saw that we had gone from a culture defined by the Protestant ethic and the, the value of hard work and discipline and frugality to a culture that prized bling and celebrity and narcissism. And to illustrate that, I have um, a photograph from my first project in 1987 on the left about the French aristocracy. Yeah, I was interested in this idea of an of a upper class that did not have money, because many of them didn't have money anymore, and this idea that class wasn't necessarily defined by money. And then on the other hand, um, on the right is Suzanne, a socialite in Toronto, who's married to a media mogul. and is kind of like the new um, princess, and she's wearing a Valentino gown, and her fashion and design muse is um, a character from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, truly scrumptious. <laughs> and here's Suzanne again in one of her four seasonal closets, and the orange boxes are her Hermes Birkin bags. So when I was putting this together, I kept thinking about the elements that represented this sea change. And I thought about this recurring Birkin bag, which for anybody who happily doesn't know, is a Hermes designer bag that can be purchased for five figures. And this was an oft-repeated reference from unexpectedly diverse subjects throughout the world. And besides this surprising knowledge about a five-digit bag, I also became obsessed by the fact that Kim Kardashian, who I first photographed at 12, became a mainstream star by starting with a sex tape. This is Kim at 12, and this is Kim 16 years later. While this work is not just about the Birkin bag, Kim Kardashian, or the rise of Donald Trump, it is most definitely about the culture that made all three possible. And to represent Donald Trump, I'm going to show a picture of David Siegel from the Queen of Versailles because he has a similar aesthetic of luxury with a gold throne and, um, and, and also they both dated Jackie Siegel. <laughs> so this is me at three. And I grew up um, in kind of hippie times in Venice before it was gentrified. And my parents were professors and were influenced by the counterculture. And my mother was doing cross-cultural field work in a Maya Indian village when I was little. And I then studied visual anthropology at Harvard and um, started by interning at National Geographic. And my first project was actually with my mother. She was the writer and I was the photographer. And we were documenting a Maya Indian village in the highlands of Chiapas. And I started thinking about the world that I had grown up in, in Los Angeles, and 
how LA culture, youth culture specifically, was kind of being exported and, and in influ influencing other kids around the world through shows like Beverly Hills 90210. And I started thinking that this center of media and the kind, some of the things I had seen growing up were actually worthy of the same kind of serious study that anthropologists and photojournalists usually give to foreign cultures. So I went back to my high school. This is from Crossroads, 1992. This was the graduation. And started my first book, Fast Forward, about how kids were influenced by the values of materialism, the cult of celebrity, and the importance of image. And one of the, one of the things I was looking at at the time was the influence of the media and the way kids from very different backgrounds were experiencing a kind of homogenization of culture through the shared media. And when I was just starting this project, I was walking down the alley and these three kids said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a project about growing up in LA. And so they said, well, then you have to photograph money. That's what it's all about. And they pulled out these dollar bills. And it wasn't until I got home and looked at the slides that I realized they were holding up $100 bills. So the work became very quickly about the early loss of innocence in the media-saturated society, in the consumer society. This is a three-year-old at Barney's in Beverly Hills. And um, this is actually the same girl. When she was 16, she was in a film I made called Kids and Money, which is also part of the um, Generation Wealth show. And this is Beverly Hills High Senior Ditch Day, where all the kids ditch school, go to the beach for the day. And Mijanu, in the foreground, was awarded best physique at Beverly Hills High School. And she was actually not from a rich family. And I, I started doing interviews that went with these pictures, which was a practice I continued all the way through. And in her interview, she talked about actually how hard it was to not be from a rich family, but be in this milieu and to not have the clothes and the cars that the other kids had. But she also recognized that her beauty was a kind of passport into the popular clique. This is Emily, who is 10. Um, at the Peninsula Hotel, where she and her family were living in a $3,000 a night suite for the last three months when I took this picture. And actually, they were kind of slumming it because their two mansions had been seized by the um, federal government for tax evasion. And so they all moved into the hotel with the help in the presidential suite. Um, her father ended up doing six years in prison. And this is Adam, who was 13 at a bar mitzvah party where, his, where the mother of the bar mitzvah boy rented out the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub on the Sunset Strip and brought in go go girls to dance with the kids. And Adam's interview was one of the first I did. And it was so kind of interesting and pivotal for me because he said, first he said, well, you have to spend like $50,000 on a bar mitzvah or you're shit out of luck. But then he also said that he felt money ruined kids, and he felt money ruined him. But I also kind of pinpointed it to the time of Oliver Stone coming out with Wall Street and creating this character, Gordon Gecko, who said greed is good. Oliver Stone intended Gecko to be an anti-hero, and he became a role model to a generation, including Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, and Florian Holm, who is one of the characters in the film that I made and was a very successful hedge fund banker, made over $800 million, and then ended up um, on the FBI's most wanted list for a pump and dump scheme. One of the things that was interesting about this is looking at how Americans don't actually hate the rich or even resent the rich they, because they always imagine that will be them someday. And one of the other phenomena that I saw in terms of changing over the last 25 years was the rise in consumer goods, which really starts in the early 90s, and then the rise of global branding. And by tracking it, not just among the rich, but among the poor, among the middle class, urban, suburban, Europe, Russia, China, really kind of all over the world, seeing that this was a global phenomenon that we were principally exporting. This is a socialite in Hong Kong that I photographed, and she showed me her tattoo, which at first I thought was a religious symbol, only to find out it's the logo for the brand Chrome Hearts, her favorite brand. 
the backdrop for kind of this over the last 25 years too is that we've never had more concentration of wealth in a small group and never had less social mobility. Looking also at kind of the relationship between high-low, how the, the big brands then reverberate all over the world, but also the effects on girls and the kind of precocious sexualization that comes with fashion and the exposure to the media. In a way, girls became a case study for the way capitalism exploits insecurities and uses it as a way to make very vulnerable and and loyal consumers. This is a, a little girl playing dress up and I looked in my work, Girl Culture, at the way dress up, this kind of innocent game of dress up starts to, you start to see a kind of precocious sexualization. And what I saw is, is that if girls see their bodies as a source of value, as a source of currency, that this kind of accelerates. This is at Disney World in Orlando, and one of the th Disney is is one of the best at selling girls stuff, and particularly into this myth of the princess or into this idea of the princess, which kind of goes from cradle to grave. And in my work, I use the princess both literally and metaphorically. And um, you're never too old to be a princess. This is at Disney World. You can get married as your favorite princess. And Christina, who's getting married, was a pharmacy technician uh, at Walmart, not from a rich family, and this was her dream. And another lover of Disney princesses who actually wants to be a wedding planner when she grows up, this is Melissa, who is anorexic and is in the clinic that I filmed for the movie Thin. There's a kind of obsession with princesses and with Disney characters and with kind of infantilization from eating disorder patients. And she said that it kind of kept alive this dream of everything kind of turning out well. And so I was also looking at what happens when you don't fit into the princess mold and what that's like. And this is at Fat Camp in the Catskills. It's weight loss camp, but the girls call it Fat Camp. And they're they get weighed and measured every week, and you can see the girl on the left is holding her statistics that have the measurements of all her body parts. And this is a quinceanera um, party in Los Angeles for Ruby, and the quinceanera is the coming of age party in the Latina community, and um, Ruby, whose party it is, is not from the rich, a rich family. Her father doesn't work and her mother babysits. And they spent $16,000 on the quinceanera. It was bigger than a wedding. So was also looking at kind of how commercial rituals had become part and parcel of coming of age. This is Eden Wood, who um, is a beauty pageant winner from Toddlers and Tiaras. And... Um, is, was actually won a, a big beauty pageant when her mother came up with the idea to put her in a showgirl costume. I'm really trying to kind of deconstruct the culture so we can take a look at what's pushing the behavior. And one of the things that I saw was this, this kind of pornification of the culture, cultural wide. And the story that really woke me up to that was Sheena, who was a 15-year-old, in a public school in San Jose, California, a very typical teenager in some ways, although she had a kind of exhibitionist quality. And she said in her interview, but completely out of the blue, if I could be anything, I'd like to be a topless dancer, because I know if I can do that, I can do anything. And it kind of came together when I then was shooting at Fat Camp in the Catskills, and I saw the girls dancing like strippers when there were no boys or counselors in the, in the room. And then later that summer, I read about how the new sport, trendy sport in the upscale gyms of LA and New York was a, a class called cardio striptease or pole dancing aerobics where soccer moms and teenagers can learn how to dance like strippers. Actually, by the time I shot Queen of Versailles, um, Jackie Siegel had a pole in her closet. And one of the things I was interested in were these kind of post-national places where 
the 1% congregate. So this is in St. Bart's. That's Brett Ratner and Russell Simmons showing the cash because a lot of the restaurants in St. Bart's that were very expensive didn't always take credit cards. And this is at, um, in Monaco at a charity auction. And the auctioneer is auctioning off a Picasso and says, is there anybody here who doesn't yet own a Picasso? <laughs> well, this is in um, Switzerland. And the man in the middle is the apprentice of Switzerland, so kind of the Donald Trump of Switzerland. And so I started looking at this idea of the dream house and how that kind of fits into the American dream. And, and the dream house as a driver for the boom, which I then followed into the crash, which as you heard before, was kind of that moment of insight where I realized all the stories were connected. This is in Hong Kong. A solid gold toilet in a solid gold bathroom to get photographs sitting on the toilet. And this is Jackie Siegel and her twins in front of their private plane. Jackie is kind of an extreme example because they were billionaires and yet they also overextended. Um, they lived in a 26,000 square foot starter mansion and moved or were building a 90,000 square foot uh, palace of Versailles. And when the New Yorker wrote about the movie, The Queen of Versailles, they said her breasts were um, an expression of the overabundance of the boom. And one thing that really struck me, and the reason that the crash was kind of this moment of insight for me, is because I saw this very similar imagery and phenomenon from around the world. And in Dubai, there were thousands of cars left in parking lots and at the airport because people fled because they're debtors' prisons in Dubai. And the FCIC financial hearings, the heads of all of the banks, it seemed like this was the morality tale that we were going to learn from. When I was doing the work and the crash happened, and people like David Siegel were telling me the lessons, like we shouldn't have built so big, it seemed like we had learned our lesson. But the genie was kind of out of the bottle in terms of the export of these values spreading. And China was really the place that I saw that the most clearly. And in the beginning, it was all about designer brands. It was about Hermes and Louis Vuitton. And then kind of wealth 2.0 was actually people wanting class. People wanted education. People wanting culture. And in a way, wanting aristocracy, wanting what money couldn't buy, but which they did try to buy. So the last part I'm going to show you um, was kind of, a, this is a, from a party in Moscow, and there was this feeling post-crash of kind of dancing on the deck of the Titanic, that instead of having learned from our mistakes, there was a kind of live for today, and even more important to kind of bling out and show off in the insecurity of the post-crash world. And, and this was really right after the recession. I mean, the recession was still very, very much felt in Las Vegas at this time. And so there was this real contrast going on. And the last place I'm going to show you was from a strip club in Atlanta um, where I made a film called Magic City that's showing in the Annenberg space. In finishing here, I just want to say that it's a dark finish to the, to the work, and that's how it is in the show. But for me, the, the, the point of the work is really to deconstruct the culture and kind of the matrix that we're in and to create awareness about that. So thank you very much.